this morning. Let's look to the Word of God together, please, as we continue this morning with Lesson 3 in our sermon series entitled Spring House Cleaning. How many here today have been getting some uh, spring house cleaning in the natural done uh, this spring, hopefully in the spiritual as well as we've been talking about these matters over the last couple of Sundays. This morning we're going to be looking at a variety of scripture passages and uh, they will be on the screens today and on the outline as well. We want to remind you that due to the holiday weekend, some of our Sunday school classes will not be meeting today. Others will be meeting. And so if there's a sign on your door that says we will not be meeting, guess what that means? That means your teacher decided that they were not going to be meeting today and you can move right next door to another class if you'd like to for the day. And so um, we invite you to be a part of that uh, if you'd like to be. Pastor Bob is on vacation today. We wish him a happy vacation. He and Deanna and their family pray the Lord gives them a rest and a refreshing today. Despite what he does when I'm gone, I'll make no crude remarks about him from the pulpit uh, this morning. I'm always the kind one and he's, he's always poking and jabbing and stabbing and backbiting and all of those kinds of things. Well, Mark chapter 5, verse 19 has been our key scripture for this series of messages. As we hear Jesus say to that man who was delivered and healed, go home and build a home where God is worshiped. Tell him what Jesus has done for you. It's not enough, man, that you've experienced the touch of Jesus. Take that good news and that work of the Lord right back into your own home and get God into your house. We've been talking about building a healthy, holy Christian home. And that is critical in the world in which we live today. We live in a day where the world is increasingly wicked and godless, anti-Christ and anti-Christian. And where many churches are abandoning biblical principles and becoming social clubs, refusing to preach the Bible, rejecting biblical accountability and morality and ethics. How many of you understand this morning, the Bible is not a book from which we can pick and choose. The Bible is an authoritative book. It is God's book. And the Christian home must be filled with that book and with the presence of God. And the Christian home needs to be, in the midst of this world, a spiritual fortress where Jesus is Lord, where the Bible is central, where the Holy Spirit is is working. Sometimes we may sing a song here in the sanctuary directed to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I hope you know that we can sing those kinds of songs in our own homes as well. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Come and work and and do your business right here in our homes. Work, Holy Spirit. Lesson one in this series urged us to get rid of spiritual junk that has polluted the home of many Christians for too long. Get rid of the junk. Jettison the junk. Lesson number two, last Sunday morning, called us to elevate the atmospheres of our homes with godly attitudes. Get rid of the poisonous attitudes and fill the air with the sweet smell of godly attitudes and atmospheres. Today, we send out this warning. Every Christian home needs to have a clear Christian value system in place where the values of our homes are guarded and protected and prized and are precious to us. A value system. We begin this morning with these four words of definition as we begin to think about a value system in the home. Number one, a value system is a set of non-negotiable beliefs or principles or a code of ethics by which a person or group lives. This is what we believe and how we do business. This is us, okay? Number two, every home has a value system in place, whether consciously defined or, and declared or not. 
You have a code of ethics in your home. You have a standard, a spiritual standard in your home. It wouldn't take somebody too long to come into your home and begin to decipher and determine what your value system is by the way you talk, the way you live, the things you do, even the way you spend your money. We could go on and on and on. It would be easy to determine what value system is in place in your home. Number three, a value system is not merely stated in words. It is lived out in intentions and decisions and actions. And number four, a value system produces character qualities and strengths which enable us to live out our definitions of success. I live the way I do. The members of my family live the way we do to a great degree. Now, there is free will involved in everybody's life. But to a great degree, my family, I have a number of family members here today, and our family is who we are. We live the way we live. We talk the way we talk. We don't talk the way we don't talk. Because my parents, my dad, seated over here by the door, and my mom established early on in their home a value system by which we would live. And we lived that out. I make no apology for having deep roots with strong spiritual convictions. Those things serve us well if they are established properly. And so this morning, we want to talk about value systems in the home. We'll talk this morning about secular values. Third, secondly, we'll talk about scriptural values. And thirdly, we'll talk about straightening and strengthening spiritual values in our homes. Let's begin by taking a whirlwind tour of some secular values that have worked their way many times even into churches and into Christian homes. When we talk about secular values, we're going to talk about you know, what people believe and, and, and what they hold as precious values secular values. Let's take, first of all, an inventory of secular values. You might say, well, why even mention these? We mention these so that we will not be ignorant of the devil's devices and his attempts to invade our hearts and our homes. Sometimes we talk about the army that is coming against us so that we are prepared to intercept it and win the victory. Could I have a better amen? We need to know the enemy, to a degree at least. We need to know the Lord first and best, huh? But we need to understand what's coming against us. So let's think about some secular values. And here they are. First, secular philosophical values confuse the Christian home because they seep into every crack in, in, through which they can get. How many of you have noticed a spider in your house this spring? Anybody here seen a spider? How about a cockroach? Well, don't go there. Don't go. How many of you have seen some bug inside your house this spring? Yep, yep, sure you have. Wouldn't you love it if your home was so airtight that no bug could ever get into your home? Wouldn't that be awesome? I would love that. I hate spiders. Every now and then a worm somehow gets into my downstairs family room. When I first bought that house last year, I came down into the family room after I'd bought the house and there were like six worms on the carpet spread out. Now by this time, they were, they were dried as dust. I thought, what in the world is this? Well, this spring I experienced the same thing. I'm calling it now the March of the Worms. And somehow they make their way through some, something under the door or something, and they, they march into my family room. They think they are 
They think they are moving toward the promised land, I guess, but ultimately they drop dead in the wilderness like the Israelites of old. Well, we wish, we wish no bug would ever be able to make its way into our homes. But I can tell you this this morning, the cleanest of homes will have bugs because there are little minute cracks and crevices through which the bugs can get in. It is the same principle at work spiritually when it comes to the, 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 the values that are existing in this world. They're going to make their way into our homes. We've got to recognize them as worms or as spiders or as roaches or God forbid, as little snakes. And we've got to intercept them and deal with them appropriately. Think about these philosophical philosophical values that are confusing Christian homes. First is relativism. Now, we don't have time to take a a long time on each of these. Let's just look at a simple definition of each one. Relativism says that there is no absolute truth. Ever heard that? And that truth is relative to each person or situation. Aristotle, way back several centuries before Jesus, Aristotle uh, established what he called situational ethics, relativism. Then there's humanism, which declares that humans are the supreme and central beings in the universe. How many of you recognize that, you Christians? You recognize the flaw in that immediately. Two truths serve us well. There is a God, number one, and number two, you're not him. Huh? Number three is liberalism. Liberalism, in a philosophical sense, says that humans are autonomous and naturally good, not fallen or sinful. Well, if you looked in the mirror this morning, you know that's not accurate. Fourth is secularism. Secularism declares that religion is not relevant to human welfare and is an unimportant pursuit. There's no God and religion is a waste of time. Fourth, fifth, is skepticism. That is, nothing is knowable and every assertion of so-called truth should be doubted. Eternal skeptics. Next is what we know as naturalism. That is, there is no supernatural force in the universe, only the forces of nature. Anybody here ever received what you would consider to be a miracle from God? I have. I have, I have received some things in my life that I would perceive to be and would just have to conclude was a miraculous intervention from God. I don't have time to tell the story, but some of you have heard my stories uh, many times. The next secular philosophical value is nihilism. That is, life does not have any objective meaning and existence is pointless. Some of these things we could see might have impacted some of the recent tragedies that we have seen. Life is meaningless and pointless. And then there is what we call fatalism. That is, everything in the universe and life is predetermined and inescapable. It's a fa- that's called a fatalistic attitude. Everything is just, it is what it is. We may think we, you know, that we have a part in the process, but we really don't. And you know, friends, sometimes some of these kinds of philosophies even invade Christian theology. For example, Calvinism is a medieval invention that is sort of a blend of fatalism and Christianity, working it all together. And and yet, many churches don't even recognize the influence of secular thought. And so, secular philosophical values like these confuse the Christian home. It's no wonder... The Apostle Paul prophesied in 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, 
Some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Look up at me, everybody. Did you know that some of the things that people believe, even people who have been Christians, they've abandoned the faith? Do you know that some of the things they are believing are being taught to them by demons? Things taught by demons. Now, let's, let's just sort of boil that down. That simply says that spiritual deception has a devilish root to it. The, the devil, the enemy, demonic spiritual forces, their goal would be to draw us away from the truth of Christ because it's only when we know the truth that the truth can set us free. Could I have a better amen? So we, we have these secular philosophical values. Secondly, this morning, secular practical values cripple the Christian home. Now, those philosophical ideas that we just mentioned, they seem to be maybe removed from you. They're not removed from us. They weave their way into people's thinking regularly. But let's look at these, at these practical secular values that really cripple Christian homes. First is materialism. Materialism says money and material possessions are most important in life. Hmm. Now, I doubt if anybody in the room this morning would ever say that, but some would live like that. Hmm. Many times, friends, there is a wide gap between our creeds and our deeds. What we say we believe and what we practice, oftentimes there's a huge gap between those. The Christian life is intended to be about narrowing and closing the gap between what we believe through the truth of Scripture and how we really live. Amen? So, there's materialism. Secondly, there is what we call hedonism. Hedonism is, says that pursuing pleasure is the primary goal because of the brevity of life. Okay? You only live once, they say. Seize the day. Carpe diem. People have different definitions about what it means to seize the day. For, for the hedonists, they would say seizing the day means have as much fun as you can today because you're not going to be around tomorrow. Hedonism does not hold eternity in view. Obviously, it's a heathen philosophical value. Materialism, hedonism. Third is individualism which says that the selfish agenda should prevail and each person should look out for number one. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Do what's best for you. And the last one we'll deal with, these sec secular practical values, is cynicism. It declares that nothing really matters and an apathetic negativism about life should prevail. You know what the word cynical means. Well, cynicism uh, is, is at the root of, of that adjective, cynical. Cynicism just says nothing really matters. Because of that, we just always have a scowl on our faces and we doubt every, we just, we, we, are, we are negative about everything. These secular values have invaded many Christian homes. Notice the invasion of secular values. Let's think about that. How, does, how do secular values invade the Christian home? Well, they invade through worldly education and they invade through wicked entertainment, the primary methods, okay? Worldly education, wicked entertainment. If you lived in a bubble through which nothing could ever get through, and you had your Bible and the Holy Spirit and, and your worship music and all of those things, and your home was never invaded by any random or intentional wrong thought process, then maybe you could live in bliss forever, but that is not how this world works. We're not of the world, but how many of you know we live in the world? 
And how many of you go to work every day? Come on. How many of you have to go to work every day? How many of you do watch some news occasionally? Uh, how, how many of you see things online or on television or, or any other avenue of communication, social media, all of those things, all kinds of information come streaming into our homes? We asked two Sundays ago, is that stream like a dirty river or is it like a pure river from God? What are the things that are coming into our homes? Well, these secular values come in through worldly education and through wicked entertainment. When we think about education, it's not just in schools, but we're talking about education through news media, through the preaching of politicians, even through unbiblical teaching of corrupt spiritual leaders. Huh? The New Testament prophesies and predicts that in the last days, some spiritual leaders who claim to be Christian leaders would promote the wrong things based on wrong spiritual values. Those things can make their way into the home. Worldly education declares the secular values. Worldly entertainment illustrates secular values, thus creating, is everybody awake today? Worldly entertainment illustrates the working out of secular values so that, see if you know what this means, new comfort zones are created for the Christian. Hmm? New comfort zones. That used to be really off limits and and offensive to me spiritually. But as I am baptized and inundated more and more with things that are coming at me, I become more and more comfortable with those things and new comfort zones are created regularly. I can tell you right now, dear friends, the Bible has not changed in 2,000 years. Are, are you awake this morning? The Bible has not changed in 2,000 years. Listen to me. But the standards in Christian homes have. Huh? How has that happened? The scriptures remain the same. The spiritual standards in Christian homes have changed and changed and changed and the lines have expanded and the boundaries have extended and things that at one time were totally off limits in the Christian home are welcomed with joy and laughter in today's Christian home. I knew this would not be a popular message just like the other two, but here we are. You might as well sit through the rest of it. Might as well sit through the rest of it with your cynical expression on your face. An inventory of secular values, the invasion of secular values. What are the implications of secular values taking hold of our Christian homes? Well, they are obvious. Secular values lead to sin, selfishness, senselessness, short-sightedness because it's only the promises of God and scripture that tell us we need to be living for heaven and eternity. Amen? And ultimately, secular values lead to spiritual shipwreck. In our Wednesday night study this past Wednesday night in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the apostle Paul declared at the end of the chapter after teaching everybody, uh, you know, to, uh, to be strong, Paul said, I have to beat my own body. I have to discipline myself so that after I have preached the gospel to others, I myself would not be disqualified for the prize. In the King James Version, which we did not read Wednesday night, Paul refers to that disqualification as a spiritual shipwreck. Starting out spiritually well, but ultimately, your life having been destroyed by sin and the things of the world. Secular values. Well, let's move on to the better part of the message today, and that's the examination of scriptural values. 
What should the value system in our Christian homes look like? Now, obviously, when we use the word value, that word, you know, at its base level ought to suggest to you something that is precious or important to us, right? If I value something, that means I, I place mm, value on it, right? <laughs> Old word Smith Lowell here. If I value something, I esteem it. I consider it important and precious to me. When I say, what's the value of something? You know, maybe you just bought a, a, an antique and, and I heard about the lady recently who, who bought a, a Roman bust at a garage sale only to find out it was like 2,000 years old. And it was, it was a, a precious antique worth a whole lot of money. Oh, aren't you glad that she didn't paint it like I probably would have done? <laughs> <laughs> I probably would have brought it home and painted it, you know. Uh, aren't, she's probably glad she didn't do that, okay? If we value something, it's precious to us. So let's think about Christian values, biblical values that ought to mark the Christian home and the thought processes that are at work in the Christian home. Here are our core Christian values. One, number one, the Bible, I hope, I hope, dear friends, you will give me a good hearty amen after each of these values is stated. Number one, the Bible is absolutely authoritative and applicable. Amen. Yes, the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Bible is our standard. The Bible is our authority. Now, you might say today, I know most of you wouldn't, but some of you might say, well, why the Bible? There are religious books all over the world. Why the Bible? Well, let's think about a few qualities of the Bible very quickly. First of all, we note that the Old Testament was written over a period of 1,000 years, 1,010 years, and the New Testament written over a period of about 60 years. We understand and believe and hold to the authority of the Bible because of its prophetic reliability. The Bible, Old Testament, and New Testament have prophesied countless events that have come to pass supernaturally, okay? And we would declare only God can predict the future, right? If you can predict the future, come see me after service. We'll put you to work in our stock market, you know, ministry here at First Assembly. If you can predict the future. Okay? The Bible is authoritative. It's, it's prophetic reliability. It's historical accuracy. More and more and more historical studies and archaeology are demonstrating the truth of the history of the Bible. If you've never gotten into any biblical archaeology, you ought to start watching some things about biblical archaeology. One of the most fascinating things that I have ever seen, and this sounds totally disinteresting to most of you, is, is the altar built by the, the Israelites in the territory of Dan to the false gods, the false calves. You say, well, that doesn't sound very inspiring to me. You know what was inspiring to me about seeing that? As that's been uncovered, it reaches way back into the pages of the Old Testament and lays out before us in archaeological discovery the reliability of the history of the Old Testament from all of those centuries ago. I looked at that, I laid eyes on that a few years ago when I was in Israel and I thought, wow, the Bible is accurate. It's historical accuracy. It's supernatural unity. 
And ultimately, we believe the Bible because of its validation by Jesus of Nazareth, who is the only one who ever rose from the dead never to die again. Jesus is alive. And Jesus bears witness, bore witness to the authority of the scripture. Hmm. So we declare the Bible to be absolutely authoritative and applicable. Somebody came to me a few years ago with a worksheet produced by their pastor in a Wednesday night study right here in Jefferson City. And the worksheet declared right in print, the pastor had written, well, the words infallible and inerrant are too strong for us. I thought to myself, why bother with the pastoral ministry? Why open the Bible to the congregation if you don't believe the Bible is inspired by God, is free from error in its original autographs, and has authority to guide and govern our lives today? Why bother? But friends, we have a reliable Bible. These, uh, these Christian core values are important to us, but they're not so important that we need to spend three hours on them this morning. So let's look at number two. They really are, but we've got to move. This is a summary message today. One, the Bible is absolutely authoritative and applicable. Number two, God is sovereign and supremely good. First Timothy 6, God is the blessed and only ruler the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. God is God, and God is good. Number three, people are precious, but they are perishing in sin. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And, and we, we, we just have to say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is an answer. His name is Jesus. Would you say amen? amen. For, for life is limited, but eternity is everlasting. Amen. amen. Hebrews 9, 27, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Number five, here's the fifth core Christian value Jesus is the only source of salvation. Hmm? Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which, by which we must be saved. Number six, people are divinely designed with purpose and potential. Hmm. Jeremiah 1 verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Hear me, friends. Hear me, friends. Why are we pro-life? We are pro-life because God is the author of life, and God creates life with purpose and potential. Amen? Look at the seventh of our core values. Success and significance are fundamentally spiritual. Okay. You may have every title upon your name. You may have gained the highest position in your field. You may be well known to the world. You may be popular in your setting. But I want you to understand that real success and significance are spiritual. Your relationship with God. Hmm? Yeah, yep. Yeah. The most important thing in your life, everybody under the sound of my voice, is your relationship with God. Amen. Yeah, even the things that are most precious to us in this life will eventually, those things will change. Now, we have, we have, the, we have the privilege of impacting the people in our lives for eternity so that we can spend eternity together, but even in heaven, those relationships will change. They will be different kinds of relationships. The most important thing in our lives is spiritual. Success and significance are fundamentally spiritual. Jesus said that every believer should be looking forward to the eternal commendation from God. 
well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Jesus spoke those words. I've used those words in many funeral services, as have many preachers and pastors I know. Well done, good and faithful servant. How many of you have ever, have ever heard those words spoken at a funeral service? Well done, good and faithful servant. I, I, I speak those words at funerals sometimes. Jesus spoke those words in a parable that he was teaching, but the parable was demonstrating that the ultimate goal for every human being is to receive the approval of God someday and the commendation of God. That's what we want. So these are, our, these are our core Christian values. From these core Christian values flow statements like these. Spiritual health is our first priority. Is everybody still with me? Yes. Spiritual health is our first priority. How about this? We believe the Bible, what else, whatever anybody else says. Hmm? Uh, prayer is powerful. Uh, God's standards of morality are non-negotiable. Huh? Even when we don't understand them? Even when others don't approve of them? Even when others say that God is wrong and wrong is God? Huh? Yep. We say God is right. We treat others with love and kindness. We will be faithful to be in church and support our church. Could I have a better amen? amen? Life is meant to be lived for God. Amen. Yeah, all of those things flow from our, our core values. Let's think about the consequences of Christian values at work. Here they are. Uh, let's move real quickly here, everybody. Here are the consequences. You say, well, it's not our fault, it's your fault. If we're not moving quickly, don't tell us. Okay, let's move quickly, everybody, Move a little quick, more quickly, everybody. Okay. Here are the consequences of Christian values. Loving the Lord, prioritizing people, treasuring time, amen, and focused on forever. Those are the outgrowths of a, of a biblical value system at work in our homes. Well, then how do we, let's look at the last section on the outline. How do we straighten and strengthen spiritual values in our homes? Well, we've got to get these core values so deeply rooted in our homes that everybody knows them. Are you here? We, we, you cannot afford to have a home where the members of your household don't know that the Bible is our authority. Are you here? We, our homes have to be filled with these core values. We have, to, they, we have to make them known. And to the best of our ability, come into agreement around these biblical values. This is what we believe. And these are the beliefs that guide our decisions. Mm. So how do we do that? Well, look, look at these two. Uh, these are two simple principles with um, eight subpoints. Okay. One, we need Christian education in the home. Huh? You say, that sounds like work, Pastor, and we're already busy as parents. We're taxi drivers, we're, we're cooks, we're, we're uh, remote control passers. You know, we're lawnmowers. We do all of these things at home. We cannot, listen, you cannot become too busy to be teaching biblical truths in your home. Even if it's just you in your home by yourself. You gotta get the Bible down inside of you. Even if it's just husband and wife at home, you've got to encourage and strengthen one another with the word of God. Do you know everything? No. Is there room to grow? Yes. So we need Christian education in the home. What should it look like? Well, first of all, it must involve consistent Christian character. Parents, you can't say one thing and do another. Can I say something that might rub some of you the wrong way? I said a long time ago, if I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way, let the cat turn around. There went the cat. <laughs> Somebody just shot the cat. <laughs> K 
Can I say something that might rub some of you the wrong way? Don't drop your kids off at church and you go home to watch TV. Well, that did it. The sermon's over, I know. That did it. (laughs) Don't do that. How ridiculous for somebody who wants to teach their children valuable lessons. No. If church is important for your kid, it's important for you. You say, I got all I need, baloney. I got, I've got two, you say, well, I've got, I don't need it like they do. I've got two responses to that. Number one, baloney. And number two, bah humbug. (laughs) Those are my two responses. Say, those don't sound very academic. Well, it is what it is. We teach by example. Paul told Titus, in everything, set the people an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech. One of my favorite little poems I learned years ago says this. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather you walk with me than merely point the way. The eye is a more ready pupil than ever were the ear. Good advice may be hard to follow, but example is always clear. Hmm? We must have consistent Christian character in our homes. If you cheat on things, don't be surprised when your kid becomes a shoplifter. We must have coaching in the homes, too. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord coaching. Third, we must have conversations in the home. Deuteronomy 6 says about the laws, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Get the spiritual conversations going. Hear me, hear me now. Every parent, every Christian parent should establish an environment in your home where your children at any age can ask you any question about any matter, spiritual, secular, amen? amen. Sexual? Amen. Are you here? Yes. Ethical? Any subject, no subject matter is off limits so that, so that they may feel free to ask you about those things and you may, may answer them with biblical thought processes. You say, well, uh, I don't know all the answers. Well, sometimes we have to say, well, let's research that and, and, and find out the, what the Bible says about these things. We, we, we need conversa- spiritual conversation taking place in the home. Sometimes we need confrontation. Titus 1.9 says, um, a deacon must hold, hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. We need to know enough biblical doctrine in this day and age, friends, so that when somebody says, well, what about this? We can say, no, no, the Bible says that's, that's wrong. That's not right. That is not God's plan. Hmm? There are a lot, of, a lot of things that our kids will come home with today. They'll say, what about this? And, and we need to be able to say, no, that is not God's plan. Let's look it up in the scriptures. Let's see what that plan will lead to. hmm? And let's see what God's plan leads to, right? There must be loving confrontation. And fifthly, there must be congregating. Hebrews 10, 25, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. We we need to congregate at home as believers and to congregate weekly with a Bible-believing local church. We need Christian education in the home. Lastly, what time is that clock up there? I can't see that clock clearly enough up there. I think it says 925. Is that what it says? 925. Lastly, we need Christian empowerment in the home. We need the word. We need the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God. Oh, I love this verse. 
The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We need the word of God swimming in our home. Amen. Yes, yes. And listen, we, don't, we need to be careful, as we said two weeks ago, we need to be careful that we don't have competing forces flowing around in the home. Are you here? When I say competing forces, we don't need the word of God flowing here, but the word of God having to fight against other things that we are bringing into our homes and, 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 and coming against each other. So there's spiritual turmoil in the home about what is right and what is good. Are you listening? We, we can't afford that. How many of you want the word of God to be prominent in your Christian home? Lift your hands, say amen. How many of you want the word of God to be working powerfully in your home? Yep. Then, then don't, don't bring in spiritual forces that will naturally fight against the power of the word of God. Yeah. This is better preaching than you're responding we need the word of God in our homes. Secondly, we need wisdom. Oh, how we need wisdom in this world. And James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. We need God's wisdom. Listen, and that's why, oh, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and operating the wisdom of the Lord. Oh, I feel the urgency right now to pray a prayer for God to give us as his people spiritual wisdom in our homes. Can we do that right now? Can we agree right now that God will give us spiritual, supernatural wisdom for dealing with the things that we need to deal with in our homes? Father, in the name of Jesus, this is a difficult world. Thank you for your word. We love your word and we declare it to be our authority. But Lord, in the midst of this world, we need wisdom even in the application of your word and and in the communication of your word and in, in how to wrestle through difficult situations in the love of God. Give us wisdom in our homes, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody who will receive it says amen. amen. And lastly, on the outline, we need willpower. Whew. Philippians 2.13 It is God who works in you both to will. Everybody say will. It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. I'll never forget hearing a sermon many years ago preached in this pulpit by our dear friend Randy Hurst who preached from this text and said, some of you are struggling even to get up the will to do what is right. And he labored at length, expounding to us about the importance of allowing God and asking God and surrendering God to God so that God might work to change our will. Hmm? Because some of you, some of you, would walk right out of the house today and not make one adjustment to anything based on the sermon this morning. What you need is willpower. You're a Christian, yes? Huh? You're a Christian. You've heard these three sermons these last Sunday mornings. There are adjustments that need to be made in your own home. You're a Christian. You love the Lord genuinely, right? But you don't have any willpower. You go right out of the house and everything just continues the same. The same brokenness prevails in your home. And nobody has the willpower to do anything about it. We need willpower. Say, Pastor, are you mad? No, I'm not mad. I'm mad at the devil. Yeah. I'm intense sometimes because, listen, listen, we need to be doing business for the Lord. 
Are you, are you hearing me? We pray for revival in our nation, but if you're not willing to have a revival in your home, we'll never have a revival in the church. We'll never have a revival in the city. We'll never have a revival in the nation. If it can't begin in your own home, it's not going to spread anywhere. So we need willpower. It's God who works both to will and to act according to his purpose. So God, help us, help us to employ our spiritual will to get things done in our own homes. Mm. Hmm? Give your people willpower, Lord, to do business in their own homes so that next month our house, our spiritual house, can shine more brightly inside and out than it ever has before. Growing and going in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand, please, everybody. Oh, my, my. You say, here we are. We're back to the old schedule and back to the old sermon length. Here we are. Well, oh, oh. oh. These are important matters, dear friends. Yes. These are important matters that are before us in these weeks on Sunday mornings. We've been dedicating our homes to the Lord. Let's do it again this morning. Can we right now? Before we leave the house of God, gather together in your family group right now, please. If you've got family here in the house, gather quickly. I'm not gonna keep you long, but I want us to come into spiritual agreement this morning. Gather together, gather together. Is there anybody in the house who, who you've never received Jesus as your savior? You want us to pray for you today? and you want to come to Jesus and, and, and invite him into your life? Anybody like that? Lift your hand up and wave it at me. I don't want to miss you today. You, you want to become a Christian today? Anybody here? All right. Gather with your families right now. Let's, let's dedicate our families, our homes to the Lord right now. Ah. Uh, Look here for just a minute. Some of you, some of you here today, you heard the message last Sunday about those attitudes that are creating the atmospheres in the homes. And even after, even after last Sunday's message, some of you needed to go home and apologize and ask forgiveness of your family. And you did not do that, you old stubborn thing, you. Hosea said, how can the Lord pasture you like a lamb in a meadow if you are stubborn like an old heifer? Don't be stubborn toward the Lord. Humility will start the work in your home. If you, if you need to, to apologize and ask forgiveness to other members of your household at home for progress to begin, you need to do that. Whether it's right now through a whisper or as soon as we get out of church today or at home this afternoon or something, you need to set the air clear. Are you listening this morning? You say, why does church have to be so uncomfortable? Well, it is. We, we, we mean business here. Okay, Father, thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the time allotted to us this morning and for the extra time that you've given us. Thank you for this body of believers and for these families gathered here today. We pray, oh Lord, in Jesus' name, a blessing of dedication over every home represented in this service today. Lord, whether it's a home of one or 15, we pray, oh God, that you would invade our homes again, afresh and anew by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen us and renew us, Lord. Help us, Father, to establish core spiritual values in our homes that are clear and non-negotiable. 
values which will create godly characters with the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we invite you to do your work, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name that the forces, the spiritual forces that have been working against peace and unity in our homes would be broken now in the name of Jesus. And that healing would come and wholeness would prevail. Oh, Father, we thank you for these things. Lord, I pray that people in this room this morning even would begin to notice the difference in their own homes. Ah, 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 that corner is cleaner now. Ah, that room, that room is fresher now in the house. In a spiritual sense, Lord, let us recognize the work that you are doing, oh God, and be grateful and continue the process, Lord. We love you and we thank you. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon this congregation as we move into the holiday weekend. Lord, may we experience your protection, your rest, your peace, your joy. May the work of God have full liberty, liberty to be taking place in our lives. And we thank you for it all, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. We love you, everybody. Have a great weekend and a great day in the Lord.